And then with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenter, Padma Shah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on art experiences integrated with academic and functional outcomes for learners with significant learning needs. As I was thinking about this topic, the concern that I have when I visit classrooms that serve students with a variety of complex uh, learning needs, you know, communication, cognition, and motor needs, one of the things that I often find is these students are minimally engaged. How do we get them motivated? How do we grab their attention? How do we make sure that they are actively participating in the activities? So what the things that I thought is to use art as a means and integrating it with academic and functional learning objectives. It was a bit of a challenge, but I have included it, um, a variety of uh, adapted tools and techniques in this webinar. And it's also drawing from my book on this subject. With that introduction, let me go ahead and begin. Why art? one may think. First of all, whenever we think of art, it is highly motivating. And art also involves hands-on. And our students with complex learning needs do need almost all of their activities involving a hands-on type of uh, action. And art is engaging. And again, it is fun, it's joyful. And I'm sure many of you will agree that it is also therapeutic. And most importantly, art is brain friendly. Neuroscience strongly supports art experiences for brain development. And it is important to note that 14 parts of the brain light up when we are engaged, when children are engaged in art activities. Whereas when you are using words only about, compared to that, only about four or five parts of the brain light up. So that is another reason why art is a good way, good means to embed our learning objectives. What kind of art can we use? We can use fine arts and we can use performing arts. We can use role play and drama. We can use movement. We can use music. And we can also use yoga if you think of it as a movement. And you can address a variety of learning objectives language arts, vocabulary building, literacy building activities, math, science, social emotional, and also pre-vocational type of activities. So what am I going to focus in this session? How do we design and deliver a variety of enriching art activities? When I say enriching, they are not just art that will build children's creativity and engage them, but also embedding, integrating math, science, literacy, vocabulary, uh, and language development. And uh, what, as I said, we can use visually art, we can use music, movement, and role play and drama. And this is particularly helpful for students with complex cognitive communication difficulties. One of the things 
that I often see when I visit these classrooms is many of these students, as I said before, are kind of minimally engaged with the adult quite often performing the task for them. So how can we improve self-dependence? How can we improve choice-making opportunities? How can we improve self-expression and at the same time, increase their ability to be creative? And the other benefits of some of the art activities is it will help them to be much more social and engage with their peers. And so you can also embed social emotional learning objectives within art. And one of the things we are always aiming for, how much is the student gaining self-dependence? Ultimately, one of our major objectives for students with complex learning needs is to help them to be self-dependent and to be able to communicate their needs and wants and to gain learning, uh, learning objectives. And ultimately, our goal is that these students engage with different objects in their environment and we will enhance their knowledge of the world around them so that their self-image as well as the perception of others about the students will also improve with that engagement. With that introduction, let me um, find out who are the participants. I would love to know who is participating and I'm wondering, um, where the polls are. I don't. Uh... Do I see the polls? Would you like me to launch the first one? Yes, please. Okay. I don't see the polls on the Okay, thank you. Thank you for launching. Sure. Okay. Go ahead and let us know. The role you play. Are you a special education teacher, administrator, speech pathologist, occupational therapist, physical therapist? Or are you a behavior therapist, counselor, social worker, or a paraeducator, or a parent? I don't know if the poll is working. I don't see the poll working. I'm getting some results here. Uh, they're just kind of slow to come in. Looks like majority special education teachers followed by occupational therapists. And then other would be third. Okay, finally, I do see the polls. Maybe I'll be able to do it uh, next time. Okay. Are there any paraeducators there? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, somehow it didn't work very well for me. Maybe it will work the next slide around. And just a brief introduction about myself. Um, you would have seen my name at the title slide. I'm Padmaja Sarathi. I'm an author of multiple books. And today's presentation is uh, substantially from this book on serving students with uh, um, severe and multiple disabilities and this other book 
students with significant disabilities at the crossroads of IDEA and ESSA, and also a little bit from this book on autism. These are all the books that I have written, and I provide educational consulting services and webinars and uh, write books. With that, I'm going to go ahead and begin uh, the presentation. One of the first things I was thinking, which is kind of very different, is how do we use with stories that we routinely use, uh, like the very busy spider with a younger child, and the Charlotte's Web may be at the elementary level. How do we connect it with art? So I thought of something called a fly swatter art. What you need for this is a fly swatter, some colored paints, newsprint or construction paper. What the student does, or you may have to help, but you can attach a fly swatter if the student has motor difficulties to a uh, Velcroed glove or something like that. So the student dips the fly swatter. Also a simple thing like a ponytail holder and the student can have the fly swatter inserted inside that. And then dips it in the paint and the, you know, you can have either the paper hanging on the wall and the student goes near and dips the fly swatter in the paint and does kind of swats with the fly swatter on that paper, or it could be attached to the student's desk. If they are sitting or they can do it as group art, several students, three or four students around a rectangular table and they can do the fly, they can dip the fly swatter and then, you know, do the fly colored swats on that paper. And then they can use a spider stamp to add a spider image on that, uh, you know, the swats that they have done, which is the web. They have created a web, spider web, and they have used a stamp. And that is the first step for them to understand that the spider's home is a spider web. So this is the beginning stage. Then you can also connect it with that story of either the busy, very busy spider at the preschool level or the Charlotte's web, and they can learn story elements once they have gained that concept. They can identify the story setting. They can identify the characters in the story. They can identify at the preschool level, they can identify the characteristics of a spider about it having eight legs and they can count that. It will help to increase comprehension, vocabulary, and they can also match pictures created in art with the story elements. And what the two stamps that you hear, you see here, they can have the characters from the story uh, and attach to some kind of object so that they can dip it in paint and then they can stamp it. So that is one way they can do art and connect it with literacy. And then as a follow-up, or even before that, you can introduce it and the at art activity could be a follow-up. You can combine it with a story map organizer too. And this is how it looks as I am showing, and you will see it on that screen as well. And one of the things is this is all attached and they can attach it. They can use the foam shapes or felt images and they can attach it to the story map that you see. So each student has a story map and it is possible in the beginning, they may be just focusing on just the characters. And then you are building on 
their comprehension and where did the story take place? And then they identify one of the events from the story. And then they try to given two or three choices. They select the picture, the image, the felt image and place it or Velcro it, attach it to the story map organizer tool. This helps to increase their compre comprehension. It becomes a hands-on activity and they, it helps to build um, vocabulary. And also because you are giving them choices and they have to select from that choice, it helps them to make choices, which is a critical component of their learning for students with significant and complex learning needs. And the other thing, they learn to follow directions, which is also very important. The other activity that you can do that's art related, and that is art, is constructing a collage. Then you can connect it to literacy, you can connect it to math, and you can also link it to social emotional development. For example, they can create a nature collage. You can go for a walk or you can go during recess. At the end of the recess, students collect flowers, leaves, stems, seeds, and they come back in and then they do this art, which is the, you know, a collage with all the things that they have collected. You can use contact paper, they can place it, and then you can use another contact paper on top and they can press on it with both hands. They do not need precise fine motor uh, control for this one. And then they have created a collage. Another option is they can actually make a book called the Nature Collage Book. I went for a walk and then the, you can pack all the pictures, maybe even three dimensional objects at the back of the book and they can select it, place it in front of them and then they can match the picture or the little object or the felt shapes or the felt images with the text on the page. So you are building their vocabulary and they are making a book and then you can showcase it in the classroom so that they can feel a sense of accomplishment and pride. The other thing that you can do besides following uh, this nature collage, you can read the book Seed to Plant. So that reading, language, literacy, art all go together. If you are doing, let's say the story of the giving tree, you can, they can create a vocabulary collage and uh, they can, you know, they can pair pictures. Either they paint the pictures or they use adapted stamps for them or you use real objects and they can match the text with these images. And then one of the things that you can do is attach an assistive voice output assistive technology device next to each of the vocabulary words so that they can press it, hear the word, see the word and interact with that. And that's another way they increase their vocabulary and also their uh, interaction with learning. You can also create a number collage attached here or little mini bags with objects inside them, maybe belts or little foam squares um, and, or any, any, any other type of maybe uh, kush balls you can attach and they attach and they remove them and they match it and they feel it and touch it. And this is particularly helpful for students who may have a tendency to put some of these things, you may want to put it inside a mini plastic ball bag and then they match it using Velcro on the back of these mini bags. Another 
uh, art activity, a kind of a collage that you can create is a feelings collage. They can put different emotion pictures and connect it with the text associated with those feelings. And then you can follow it up. Either you can follow it, follow it up or you can proceed it by reading stories that focus on emotions like on Monday when it rained or when Rosie gets, when Sophie gets really, really angry or the book, The Wizard of Oz. Anyone adapted summary of that book, I am assuming. You can read that and then connect it with the emotions collage, feelings collage, or you can do that at the, after you have shared the story. But it is helpful for them to do the uh, collage before so that they can be looking at it, they can connect it when you are sharing the story with them. Another option is that for younger children, they can make a feelings book as well. You know, some of the very simple feelings. The next um, activity is you can use feather duster. You can use a feather duster and they can make art using feather dusters. And again, you can use a variety of adaptations. You can either strap uh, foam squares uh, to their feet uh, and then they can dip their the stamp, the the you know the foam squares in paint, and then they can make marks on paper, or they can use stamps and you know flower stamp, and then they can stamp it. And you can also use you know a ponytail holder, and then stick the stamp in there, and then they stamp it on the paper. So a variety of ways you can adapt it. But one of the fun things is to use feather duster, dip it in paint, and then make flower outline on paper. And by using these things, what you're doing, you are increasing the motivation of the student. And then you can teach the associated vocabulary with it because they, it was hands-on and because they were highly motivated, they are more likely to absorb that information and sustain their attention. One of the ways, uh, this, is, this particular collage was actually done by a student. That's why it was, it's called Mason's Masterpiece in one of the classrooms that I uh, consulted. And, uh, what you can do is attach kind of um, uh, co contact paper, but place it on something a non-slip like a Dyson mat. And then the student kind of sprinkles different things selected from a box with different textures, different colors and sprinkles them and then cover it up when done, cover it up with construction paper, turn it over, and then you will still see all of the collage that's below underneath that contact paper. This may require a little bit of adult att attendance. One of the things that you can do at the beginning to create some kind of texture is the student, you can give some colored sand and put it in a Ziploc bag and snip it at the end and the student may squeeze the Ziploc bag and that creates a kind of a texture in the background for the collage. Um, you can also connect math with art. Here you see how a student can create patterns instead of just coloring, this involves using kind of foam shapes or felt shapes and the student creates a pattern. In the top one, you will see large, medium, small, large, medium, small. 
always it's important to give three iterations so that the student figures out looking at that pattern what comes next you can do color patterns you can do shape patterns you can do size patterns it helps to increase their cognitive their communication and motor skills then when they have to figure out what comes here what shape will go there what size will go there you would give them two or three choices so that they can figure out the right answer so they are making choices but at the same time you are pointing out the pattern there and the student is figuring out the pattern and also making a choice and so they can create repeated patterns like that and that could be a decorative item for example most of the classrooms have bulletin boards students can make the borders for these bulletin boards using these kind of patterns that they have created they can also use it to create greeting cards and have that pattern as the top border or the bottom border or the side borders for greeting cards you can use use it as i said you can use these kind of stamps and then you can attach it with velcro with a craft stick and then all they have to do even if they do not have the fine mode of precise control you can insert it in their hand and then they can stamp on that if they have motor issues and then of course all of you know that the students can make uh, patterns like this and patterns using numbers and then you can also involve your students partly art partly language the word family pattern so they can create a group of words ending in i ing ing and then match them with pictures one of the important thing to remember is to not to overwhelm them with 10 different words but just give them three or four letters so that they can make the word as shown here king and ring and sing and you may even want to begin with just making two words in the beginning but you could also give them a vertical abc chart so that oh which one that's a i n g is that a word c i n g is that a word no so you can also start teaching that at the same time they create these word uh, families and then they attach the pictures foam pictures or felt pictures or if you don't have any of those things which i would suggest if it has texture that student can feel that so it is better at least if not at least some kind of a uh, one dimensional picture you can attach they can attach it and you can display it and you can make it like a collage and display it on your bulletin board and maybe one student makes ing words another one makes end words another student makes ink words and you can show them all or you can have all of them to the same word family but this is extremely important for them to feel it's hands on it's art and it's fun so that you are not always talking to them but they are also actively engaged and it is important that the student does as much of the work himself or herself and not completely hand over hand by the adult 
You can also make mini vocabulary books, connecting it with science. Like for example, here, this is the life cycle of the butterfly and they can learn the words, they can match the words to the picture. And they have to, first of all, look where the egg is, where the caterpillar is, and where the chrysalis is, there is the butterfly. And then they place it in the right order, illustrating the life cycle stages of a butterfly. They will also, you can also extend it and say about various insects and connect it with that. They match text to pictures. They identify various stages of the life cycle. They will also, uh, you can also use it to teach physical characteristics. And ultimately you make a picture book with that. And what you can do is just have four index card and they attach the pictures and then just you can make a book out of that. The students have picture on one side and then the text on the other, uh, making it a mini science book. You can also make a mini feelings book. And this is the mini feelings book. And it has all these four pages made into a little book. And this is kind of a fun activity, but some of the students may have difficulty doing it and the adult may have to help. But one of the things that they can do to make this book is you create the book, but they get to take this word and place the word, match the word and complete that sentence. In order to make this book, let me share it with you. It's a little bit of fun. It's just one single slide. And then there is this middle line, the blue line here, the blue line that's there in the middle. And then you just cut that. In other words, you have to fold it and then cut it and then it becomes, and then fold it in such a way that it becomes a book. So it's kind of a fun and the students will enjoy making this kind of a, uh, you know, looking at it, writing in it, and you may have to assist them in actually cutting it, but it will also help them if they can fold it themselves, but you will increase their vocabulary. It's kind of art, it's kind of writing, it's kind of building their vocabulary, all of that. And all they are doing is, you know, you make an extra pair of these three words, happy, sad, and scared, and they get to glue it on here, but they will get to keep the book, each one of them. And you can use that same thing for the one that you saw the previous slide about the different uh, stages, life cycle stages of a butterfly or any of the other things or about the characters in a story. You can use the same format, except you will change the pictures and the change the text. But that mini book would be kind of attractive and highly motivating interest of the, it will interest the students uh, uh, attention and captivate the students attention. And then the other thing that you can do definitely, which is art, which is um, motivating is to make sock puppets. And this is nothing but just a pair of just a sock, a single sock, and they get to glue on googly eyes, and then they can put felt pieces. It does not have to be perfect. You can show them a model, and then they get to glue the two eyes, and then the nose and the mouth, and they can use small felt pieces to glue it on and then you can connect it with the story that you are doing. Most importantly, you can also connect it with the different organisms. And 
I will show you the other um, puppet, which is also a sock puppet. And it's the alligator or a, or you could say it's a crocodile. Again, small eyes compared to the bigger eyes of the, the monkey puppet. This is the reptile and there is the mouth and they may need a little bit of assistance. And sometimes you may have peers coming in from another classroom working with your students and that would be a good time for them to help them make these puppets. But even if it is not exactly like the model that I'm showing, if it, they can put two eyes and they can use a kind of a mouth and just stick it on the sock, that is their active engagement. And then they can talk about a, an alligator being a reptile, whereas a monkey being a mammal. And then you can teach them what's a mammal, what's a reptile. And similarly, they can make other sock puppets, just kind of color. Like for example, if you're making a ladybug puppet, maybe just a red sock and put, putting some black circles, foam circles or felt circles on it and not to spend too much time on making the puppet, much more on what is an insect. A ladybug is an insect. A butterfly is an insect. A monkey is a mammal. So you are teaching these various organisms. And then you're also going to use those puppets to teach the various characteristics, the life cycles, the basic needs of these animals. But when they make it, they will have greater ownership and interest in listening and following and making choices. Okay. The second poll. Uh, for some reason, I am not able to launch the poll. I'm not sure why it's, <clears throat> so I'm sorry, it's, it's up. Um, it is up. I can see the poll, but I'm not able to. Uh, can you see the results? No, not can I see the results. Okay. It just. Um, we have 73% uh, answered painting craft activities. Okay. Uh, that's definitely the highest. After that is 9%. And that's a tie between movement. The role, and role play activities. and drama is. Role playing drama was 6%, four out of 66 responses. Okay. And making puppets? Two out of 66, 3%. That was the lowest. Okay. It's a, it's a strange, but I'm not able to see the results or the, I see the polls, but I don't see how it's launched. Anyway, uh, looks like we need to work on role play and drama, and we are coming to that. And we also need to make, make puppets so that the children will feel a sense of ownership and it will be highly motivating. Okay, so we are moving on to movement. How do we use movement, especially with preschool and early elementary students? You can connect it with language, you can connect it with STEM and gross and fine motor. As simple as using a scarf. For example, they can wave the scarves, they can place it on their head, they can place it on their knee, or they can place it on their shoulders. So you're teaching body parts. And then you can teach up and down. You can teach sideways. And so directional concepts, positional concepts. But what is most important when you just say, put your hands up in the air, that's one thing. 
However, if you say, wave your scarf up, wave your scarf down, that adds a higher motivation level because they have some objects and they are interested in holding something that that particular action is far more engaging. So use scarves to teach directions, positions, vocabulary, and also to, also to understand, to follow directions. And then if you have them in a group, they are watching each other and that increases their peer interaction. So one of the things that I do observe in many of these classrooms that serve children with special, uh, with more significant needs, they work much more one-on-one -on -one and they are not engaging with their peers to the extent that they should. So if you have them sitting in a circle and have, let's say five to seven minutes of, let's say scarf play, that would increase their self-awareness, self-expression, -expre as well as their social togetherness. You can also use musical directions uh, for, you know, words and signs and picture cards. You can use, you know, body movement, orientation, all of that using, you know, music, uh, music CD. And one of the things that you are also teaching them to start on cue and stop on cue. So in other words, they are paying attention to your starting cues and ending, stopping cues. And that increases their attention and focus. That's one of the things you are continuously working on with these students so that their attention when you are actually teaching them math or science, something else that's different because you have built their attention through these motivating activities, their ability to pay attention increases. And you can use a variety of tools. You can use scarves, you can use streamers, you can use octaband to shake, wave, make patterns. You can use rainbow hoops. You can also play the game, freeze game. And one of the things that I would suggest is also to try and use yoga postures, bird posture, fish and flower and tree and connect it with you. Do you remember in that story, in that giving tree, what was there? There was this big tree, let's make that post. So when you connect it, they have to think about that story and they are making that association. And these are all brain building concepts and brain building activities. And shake and jingle with musical instruments. And this is a stir xylophone and there is a stick and you play with that stick and they pass it on from student to student. And that's one thing that you can use. Another one is a, is a maraca and they can hold it, they can shake it and you can also attach it to a glove like this and with a Velcro and then you can attach it to the uh, maraca. What it does is promotes personal enjoyment, strength and self-regulation, and also helps them with their cognitive flexibility when they are passing it from one person to the other and social togetherness. You can also, the student as part of the art can make a simple musical, you can call it musical instrument, just putting beans, dropping, and then you can embed counting in there. You put, five beans, you put three beans, and then they, as, as shown in this picture, you cover it up with tissue paper and you put some colorful stickers on there. And then 
put a little bit of Velcro on that. And then for a student who has motor needs, you can attach um, Velcro on that. And then you can attach the musical toy or musical instrument to the Velcro. And then they can shake it. They can stop and start on cue. And then you can say, I want you to shake it five times. I want you to shake it three times so that they listen and follow directions. You can uh, adapt uh, response and participation modes of your students depending on their physical needs. They can clap hands if they cannot. They can swing their arms. Sometimes we tend to expect the same thing from every student, but let us make that adaptation. Raise a hand, tap on tray, or blink the eyes, different ways students can participate. This is one of my favorite. And this is role play and drama. How you can connect role play and drama with science. You can use a pre-recorded dialogue using voice output devices. You can connect it with stories and they, you can connect it with the dialogue in the uh, dialogue with the character in the story. You, they can interact and engage with their peers and they can identify the emotion. I am going to just share one of those ideas. Let us say, science and motion and orbit. This is drama integrated with science. So in other words, you make props, the students make the props using paper plates. One for sun, one for moon, and one for mother earth. And the students play diverse roles, okay? You have one student who is playing the sun and with his arms outstretched as though the rays of the sun. And then one student is the moon, another student is the earth. And what is happening is the earth is orbiting around the sun. In other words, they are circling around, going around. And the moon is orbiting around the earth. It, this, I have seen it perform when I have taught it, and it brings so much joy and laughter when they perform this. But they also understand because they have made these images of the sun, the earth, and the moon, they understand the connection, and then they can go out and look out and look for the sun, look for the moon if they can see the moon and then they can look at the the world map and say this is part of the earth so they can make that connection and similarly you can act out and create story props for the visit of Oz stories and when you act out something when you dramatize something when you perform role play it makes that connection with that concept and the characters in the story. The other uh, activity uh, that I would like to share with is when you are thinking in terms of pre-vocational and adult transition classes, these are some things that you can make. Here is a topiary. As a matter of fact, this particular topiary is a picture of an art activity that the adult transition class did in one of the classrooms that I visited. And they were actually selling it. Two or three student, students worked together. These were students with significant needs with very limited communication, but they were learning to follow directions. And some of the materials were provided and the flowers were there, but they just arranged the flowers and made the topiary. Similarly, 
they use tags to make these greeting cards. And then at the end, several times a year, they had some special sale when they sold these items at the school. And this teaches math skills, reading and language skills, money skills, motor skills, positional vocabulary, and also because students are working together, the social togetherness. And one of the things is you can also have a kind of a simulated auction game. This is if you have slightly higher functioning students and they have created these artistic, uh, wonderful uh, uh, objects, these creations can be uh, part of an auction game. And uh, maybe uh, you can do it at the school level and some of the teachers or some, you know, some of the people in the schools, school can buy the item uh, to help buy more materials for such activities. And the, some of the other things that uh, your students can do is an adapted calendar. They can make feelings puppets and they can make a feelings Facebook. And one of the books that I would like to show is just made with brown paper bags. Each of the bag, this is like a puzzle. This is the insect book. Uh, and Lady, this is about ladybugs. And there is a, an item inside the brown paper bag. And they are learning earthworms eat dirt, dirt. Spiders have eight legs. And grasshoppers make music. So just using paper bags and then putting items inside there that match that insect inside the bag. There is a small felt piece. And so they made a book, but this also art activity and it's just made with brown paper bags. And similarly, you can do feelings faces. You can make a story pop prop for the giving tree. You can make feelings puppet like this. So you can make a variety of things and you can use them to extend, expand their vocabulary. So let us overcome barriers and change perceptions of our students with severe multiple uh, learning challenges. Because one of the things that impacts is the lack of exposure and limited practice. So we want to accommodate for their learning needs through providing them a variety of opportunities to engage through adaptive techniques, through adaptive tools, adaptive technology that matches them, their specific needs, and always apply the universal design for learning principles so that the students are maximally engaged the students have maximum opportunity to respond through their action and expression. And we use tools to match their needs and reduce the complexity level. And one of the things that I would like to emphasize, if the student can participate partially, let's get her involved at least partially. We have to reduce this adult hand over hand, prompting and intrusive prompting because the student is not learning much when the adult is performing the task. So it's extremely important that we maximize student involvement and minimize adult prompting. And of course, assistive, assistive technology provides us with a variety of tools, aids to generate 
student uh, communication, student participation, and student involvement. And I'm sure you're familiar with many of these devices and you can use them most creatively for each of the activities that I shared with you. So the next, um, I do have the results from the, the poll. I must have set them up incorrectly so they didn't launch separately. They launched all at once. Are you able to see the results now or still can't? Yeah, I am able to see the results, but yeah. what is happening? Uh, so all of them were launched at the same time. Yes. Looks like, uh oh, okay. Anyway, um, let me at least see the result now for the last one. Identify the strategies you routinely use. Partial participation. Good. They don't use it much, uh, but I uh, I think hopefully after this you will use much more. Ensure a para educator. That's good. That most of you do not have a para educator sitting next to the student. Um, enable the student to read and respond to social cues. I hope that will increase. And. Uh, provide hand over hand, only 15%. I sometimes hand over hand prompting may be necessary, uh, but it should be minimal, except in the initial stages of learning. Once the student can at least partially participate, we have to reduce. So these are a variety of adaptations. I know I'm maybe running out of time. So I want to show you some of the ways you can use, attach it to a glove, you can attach to a craft stick, you can attach to some kind of an object, like for example, this brush, and you can attach Velcro on the back and they can make stamps. Uh, you can use these kind of stamps. So they can participate in art activities and connect it with reading, math, science, and build also the social connectedness. The whole, in summing up, you want to integrate art activities to teach literacy, math, science, fine, fine motor and gross motor and social emotional. Engaging them in performing these art activities makes, as I said at the very beginning, learning becomes joyful and that is something I would like to see much more of when I visit classrooms with significant and complex learning needs. We want to sustain their attention. First, we want to capture their attention and then to be able to sustain their attention and focus so that they walk out with learning something new. And we want to personalize the adaptations. A student who does not have motor needs does not have to have the specific, some of the adaptations like the Velcro glove or stamp. He or she should be encouraged to perform that task without that need. But a student with motor needs, instead of the adult doing the task, we have to find adaptive tools. And many of these I have shared with you through this presentation. So use diverse engagement and response tools. Deliver systematic instruction with a system of least prompts. And then if the least prompting system does not work, then make it a little bit more of the prompting instead of using hand over hand. Students with significant learning needs do and can learn. That's important. And as I shared with you at the beginning, the main sources, most of the ideas for this presentation comes from my book, 
serving students with severe and multiple disability. There is a whole section on a variety of art, performing arts, fine arts, and blending it with academic and functional objectives. And these are various other resources and the Universal Design for Learning is a excellent source for engaging learners with significant needs. And very special thanks to AbleNet University for hosting the webinar today. I'm sorry, somehow the polls uh, didn't work as I thought it would work, but I'm thankful uh, that you were all able to respond to the polls. And the next webinar is, how do we bolster family involvement with tools and techniques to advance learners with significant needs? Especially during these last couple of years of COVID challenges, we have learned, we have come to recognize how critical that role is of the parent involvement and engagement. How do we make sure it goes on in a continuous ongoing basis so that the students not only gain from what all of you educators work with them, but also it is continued at home. With that, I am going to go ahead and see if there is any um, um, questions. I have been told not to do as much art because I have students who want to put art materials, paint, everything in their mouth. Still want to do art in my room. Okay, this is an excellent question. Don't think of it, first of all, as art. And uh, if it is your administrator who is telling them, telling you or telling other staff members not to do art, explain to them what art does. Art helps to enhance your teaching. That's first thing. Secondly, art helps to motivate and engage your learner. Third, art is just a support technique and support technique to help your students to be engaged in what you're teaching. Only thing that we sometimes tend to do, we use art separately and we do not necessarily connect it with the learning objective. What I have tried to do, if you have a chance to go back and look at the slides, on every slide that I have demonstrated an art activity, I have also shown the learning objective. So make sure that your learning objectives match connected with the art activity because it's extremely important that the, your focus is not art for art's sake, but art linked to maybe the characters in the story. Maybe you are making a book, but they are making the art for that book, which is connected to the story, like the feelings collage, or they are you have a story map organizer and they are doing the attaching the foam or the felt images to that. You are making a collage but it is a vocabulary collage, or you're making a nature collage, but you are teaching seed and plant and stem and leaves that vocabulary. So connect it with your vocabulary, connect it with your math concept, and then the art activity eliminates for your student that particular concept and learning objective you are trying to teach. And uh, that's about it. And um, all right, <clears throat> I don't want to okay. cut you off. But do you have do you have any more that you wanted to add? Or no, you... uh, okay. no. 
All right. I just wanted to see if there were any questions. Um, that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, Patrick. Uh, for anyone thank still you. with us, you will receive an email tomorrow to access access the certificate of attendance. Thank you for attending, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening or morning. See you next time. Thank you. Have a great day.